we should get started for the sake of the online viewers as well. So if any of you are out in the foyer, sorry, we'd still like to join us, please come inside and then we'll get started. Okay, I think we should just get started. Let's pray together before we start. Father in heaven, we want to thank you for this time uh, on the Holy Sabbath day that we can pause and look at this incredible creation that you've entrusted for us to live in and to influence for you. Your mind is something that we can contemplate for eternity. And I pray that you'll teach us as we delve into the, the beauties of the human mind and body again today. Help us to apply the remedies that we need to apply so that we can best influence for you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm really excited to be with you this afternoon. This is a subject I'm totally passionate about, and there's good reason for that. Um, neuroscience is called the final frontier of medicine, which means it's the area we're still very much in the dark about. And neuroscience has come such a long way um, from where it used to be. In fact, most of what we've learned about the brain, we've found out in the last 15 years. Now, I graduated from medical school about 20 years ago. I can't believe it's gone so quickly, but in that 20 years, neuroscience knowledge has, has grown leaps and bounds. Isn't this a beautiful picture? Anybody know what this is? So, fiber tracks, absolutely. So just to preface our talk, like I shared at the promo last week, I was very excited and I still am. The point, the point of these talks is that the health department, the health ministries department is here to serve you and for us to do this together as a community. We want to share tools things that put our health at risk, particularly at a brain level, and things that um, help uh, heal the brain and body. So I'm, I love the science. I've been studying the science. I'm not claiming to be proficient in every area, but I've done a lot of years of research on this topic. And uh, I want to share some of that with you. And the reason is I want us to be God's people. I want us to influence for him like he calls us to influence for him. And to do that, we need a renewed mind. And to have a renewed mind, like we said last week, we need a renewed brain. And our bodies and brains are under attack. So the point of this is this is one tool that the health ministries department is using to help you get the best out of your health, your brain and your health. This is a picture of the cerebellum. Um, this structure here, incredible structure. These are the tracts that are lighting up. They stain this, these tracts with uh, water. It's called diffusion um, imaging. And the, the, the brain shows you where these water molecules are being dispersed along the axons and cables. It's a wiring diagram. The cerebellum is an amazing structure, which maybe we'll get to unpack one day. That's the prize. If I can achieve one thing in these health talks, I want to get you excited about your health and your brain. I want to get you passionate and committed to being the best version of yourself. That's what I want for me, and that's what I would like for you. Um, God calls us to be the head and not the tail. Don't you want to be the head for God? Don't you want to influence for him? This is what's required. If this part of your brain, sorry, I've just got to find, I think I did that. My brain is working up, I promise. Uh, so that's the, no, that's not it. There it is. So that front portion there in gold is, as we said last week, is your frontal lobe. If your brain is broken, your capacity to influence in this life is diminished. If your health is compromised, you will not reach your potential in God. And ultimately, our health affects the health of our brain. Our health choices, the things that have gone wrong in our physiology, ultimately have their most significant effect by affecting our brains. And we're going to see that everything's connected. The brain and the body and the body and the brain. What affects the brain affects the body. What affects the body affects the brain. You can't separate them. And that's why we're going to talk about the body, brain, mind connection. This is first prize. I want you to get excited about this organ. ASICS. Now, apart from Elise, who knows what ASICS stands for? It's an acronym. Did you know that? What does it stand for? So I'm not a lat I did Latin in Senate 6, so it's a long time ago, but it's animo sane in corpore sano, which means sound mind in a sound body. That's the goal. A sound mind in a sound body. A nice slogan for a, a, a commercial company to have. 
a sound mind in a sound body. This is what the Lord says to us. If you listen carefully to the Lord your God and do what is right in His eyes, if you pay attention to His commands and keep all His decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Friends, I want to remind you today of that which you know. We live in a broken, fallen world. You can do the best thing you can and still get sick. You can do your very best and still get sick. But the very least we should do is our best. The very least we should do is our best. And the Lord says, when you do things my way, there's a protection that I can offer you in that. And so if we find ourselves outside of God's counsel for this time in terms of diet and lifestyle, let's be encouraged to make changes. Let's be willing to do that. Your brain and you, getting to know your organ of influence. This is the first of about six or seven seminars. We're not going to do them all at once. We're going to have every six weeks or so, uh, we're trying to have a regular seminar as part of the health work. We're going to do other things, exercise clubs, cooking demonstrations, weight loss together. I need it, you need it, we all need it. We need to get in shape because fat affects the brain. The fatter we are, the smaller our brains are, called T-Rex syndrome. There's an inverse relationship between brain volume and your body mass index. The fatter you are, the smaller your brain. Don't start thinking how small my brain is at the moment. <laughs> okay. All right. So this is a brain primer. That's the first prize. This is what we call a sagittal section. So there's going to be lots of anatomy and physiology. Ellen White says we should all be students of anatomy and physiology. We should all know how best to run. I've had patients who don't know their basic anatomy. And if you really want to get the best mileage out of a piece of hardware, you need to know how it works. And so I want to encourage you, if you haven't studied anatomy and physiology, become a student of anatomy and physiology. And the great thing is that we live in the age of information. It's on the internet. Yes, there is rubbish on the internet. But once you get to the basics in place, you can work out what's truth and what's not. Um, become a student of anatomy and physiology. This is a sagittal section through the brain, showing, sorry, my marker, it just appears obviously on the screen. But um, that is the right cerebral hemisphere you're looking at, the biggest portion. Below that, that white strip is the corpus callosum that connects the two hemispheres of the brain. This thick white part of the bottom is called the brain stem, consists of the midbrain, pons, and medulla. So this portion, sorry, I can't walk too much, midbrain, pons, and medulla. Perfect. Someone shining for me. Thanks, Brom. So that's the brain stem going into the spinal cord. We shared this verse last week. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. How are we going to be transformed? By a renewing of the mind. And we said that the mind sits on the brain. If your brain is broken, your mind will not be renewed. And the point is, the Bible, the, Paul in Romans says to us, if we have renewed minds, we can understand the will of God. We can understand and hear his voice clearer. And you and I are invited to be the people of God. And that involves certain choices we must make. If we're going to influence for him, we need to make some deliberate choices. And that's what these talks are about. So the mind sits on the brain. Important concept. My thoughts, my emotions, my conscience, my reason. Those abstract qualities are sitting, those are the software of my brain. The brain is the hardware. If the hardware on your computer is broken, how does your software run? It doesn't work very well. And it's the same in the brain. So the mind is the elements of a person that enables them to be aware of the world and their experiences, to think and to feel the faculty of consciousness and thought. So why all the fuss? We live in a very challenging world. Does anybody disagree with me? Your health is attacked from so many fronts. I was saying again earlier this afternoon, we are too busy. We are too busy. It's not an accolade to be so busy that Sunday becomes Friday in 30 seconds. That's not an accolade. That's not a badge of honor that I need to wear. And yet, unless we choose otherwise, that's the lifestyles we find ourselves in. And that constant pressure and pace is taking its toll. Your brains and your bodies, and my brain and body, are under attack from the, life, the, the ravages of modern life. And as people of God, we have a protection in the Sabbath. Obviously, the Sabbath is a huge protection factor when properly kept. Did anybody see that video about those that live 11 years longer? Sabbath keepers? They worked out that 
You saw it? Amazing thought. 11 years of Sabbaths for the extra years. So modern life, if you want to maintain your effectiveness for God, we need renewed and robust brains and minds. You're going to have to be intentional. Because left to its own, your mind will be, face, uh, will be under attack. So when our brains are broken, just putting some key concepts in place, when our brains are broken, we are ineffective for God and His work, and His work of influence through our lives. Our brains are our organ of influence. Young people, there's lots of young people here. If you want the best life, this is the organ to focus on. The guy with the best brain often gets the best girl. <laughs> Guys, you don't... Muscles are one thing, but this thing... Girls, many girls want brains. And so that's not the reason to do it. I'm saying there's many benefits. There's many benefits to having a good brain. So go to the gym because gym does help your brain. But remember, it's about your mind. And you can build, I want you to prioritize your brain and mind health. This is important. When our brains are broken, our relationships suffer. And we hurt ourselves and others. Friends, this is profound. As the young people will say, it's not cool. It's not cool when our pain and brokenness hurts others. And when we don't acknowledge where we're broken, we hurt others. We impact the lives of others negatively. People with psychiatric, and this is a terrible term to use, mental health problems, is such a loaded term. But if my pancreas can have a problem, why can't my brain have a problem? If my heart can have a problem, why can't my brain be broken and need help? Mental health problems are an expression of what's happening in people's brains. And we need to see that. But the point is, unless we acknowledge and work on fixing it, our lives can become very destructive in hurting other people. We need to look after ourselves, be healthy and whole by God's grace as much as we can, so that we can favorably impact the lives of others. At our worst, we hurt others. In these seminars, we're going to look at what harms and what heals our brains and uh, what we can do to be the best version of ourselves and as fully as possible express our potential in Him. Doesn't that sound good? Isn't that a worthwhile goal as a church community to aim for? That we become people of influence through the right choices. Quite an aggressive looking brain, eh? So I've said this, the people with the healthiest brains form the best relationships make the best decisions, have a competitive edge, so learn to highly value your brain. That excludes the use of substances, drugs, alcohol, nicotine. I'm gonna show you what that does to your brain. If you want to have the best edge, if you want to be the best for God, that's the motivation. If you want to influence for Him. To have a robust brain, we need a healthy body. We are cycling again tomorrow morning, guys. I'm going to advertise this every week. So there's still only a handful of us, but we started a cycling group, and part of the health initiative, health work initiative is that we want to encourage you to start exercise groups together. So it doesn't have to be with our cycling group at half past five or six in the morning. Um, you can start your own cycling group, start a walking group, whatever. It's done together. Get moving. The problem is, and I'm... I really, I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir, but we treat exercise as though it's an option. Exercise is not an option. It's an absolute necessity if you want to stay mentally and physically fit. So the body-brain connection. Someone knew this long before science discovered. The harmonious action of all the parts, brain, bone, and muscle, is necessary to the full and, to the full and healthful development of the entire human organism. The mind controls the whole man. All our actions, good or bad, have their source in the mind. It is the mind that worships God and allows us to heavenly beings. All the physical organs are the servants of the mind, and the nerves are the messengers that transmit its orders to every part of the body, guiding the motions of the living machinery. The electric power of the brain, promoted by mental activity, vitalizes the whole system and is thus an invaluable aid in resisting disease. We have to keep the balance. One of the failings, I'll put it out there as a student, when I first studied, all I did was study. That is the surefire way to get unhealthy. If you want to burn your brain out, 
just study without doing anything else. Ellen White talks a lot about balancing mental activity with physical exertion. And this is essential. Um, and we know what happened to James White when he worked so hard, he became ineffectual, didn't he? And so we need to keep that balance, keep everything in balance. Our physical and spiritual elements are so powerfully integrated that they really cannot be separated. So some interesting facts to get us going on this brain primer. Interesting facts about the human brain. Most of what we know, like I said, about the brain has been discovered in the last 15 years. You know how short 15 years is? So neuroscience is the, fi is the final frontier of medicine, and I think one that we're going to be probing for many years. The typical brain comprises about 2% of the body weight, but uses 20% of its total energy oxygen intake. Um, the brain is like a battery. It's an it's electrical producing organ. And if you want to stay mentally sharp, maintain your edge, you need to do those things which help the brain produce this electricity. We're going to look at some of those. So that's the ideal brain, lots of electrical power. Um, because the brain works in synapses, we're going to look at that. How do we generate electricity in a physical structure like a membrane? And the way that happens is the body uses pumps, little iron pumps, along the membrane of the neuron to maintain ionic gradients. And those ionic gradients are responsible for conducting the electric current uh, that transmits a nerve impulse from one neuron to another. So part of maintaining brain health is to make those choices that enable the brain tissue to keep its electrical activity optimal. That's essential. And that involves having enough electrolytes, the right energy source for the brain, the fuel source, but your brain is an electricity-producing organ. So this, most of us will know from high school biology, is a neuron, and this is the um, nucleus of the neuron. And what can you see? What are the components? Let's try and make it interactive, because I know we post lunch, and we've got uh, a few slides to go still. So let's try and make it interactive for fun. What are some of the components of a cell that you can see there? High school biology guys, who did well in biology? So there you can see a nucleus. That's the command center, isn't it? What happens in the nucleus? It's protein synthesis. The nucleus takes, uh, generates a thing called RNA. And that RNA is used by the cell to make proteins that are used in the cellular function. Uh, my pointer, yeah, it doesn't work on it, sorry. Uh, but it doesn't go on the screen. See, it can't transmit on the screen. It won't reflect from the screen. But um, so the nucleus there, and then, but the important things I want you to see in this, so a neuron has a cell body, it has an axon, and it has a synapse. So those are the main components of, each organ has a basic functional unit, and the basic functional unit of the brain is the synapse, which consists of um, two neurons that are communicating via this junction called the synapse. But importantly in this um, cell body, you see those green structures, the mitochondria, Throughout these talks, I'm going to make keynotes, key points. This is key point. If you want to stay brain healthy, you need to look after your mitochondria. Mitochondrial science has come leaps and bounds. If, you're, if you have all the components of a neuron to work well and you don't have an energy supply, that neuron is not going to work well. So there's a lot of research now that's been done on how, what negatively affects our mitochondria and how do we optimize mitochondrial function. So that's the mitochondrion. So most of us will remember from high school biology, the body uses substrates like glucose, like fats, to um, conduct various cycles of metabolism to generate, to pass things, electrons down on a thing called an electron transport chain to yield ATP or energy in the mitochondrion, and that drives your cellular functions. Those pumps I was talking about that maintain ionic gradients along the membrane, they need ATP to work. So when, if I have a heart attack, hopefully not ever, but if I did, my heart would stop, which means I'm not getting oxygen, which means I'm not getting ATP, which means my ionic pumps stop working. And that's part of the reason you die, is, is um, your pH changes, your pumps stop working, your enzymes denature. Um, but these mitochondria are key. If you want to maintain a sharp brain, you need to look after your mitochondria. And we're going to look at some of the ways to do that. Stronger mitochondria make for stronger brains and bodies. So eating sugary foods, 
being overweight, being sedentary, no exertion, these things destroy our mitochondria. No mitochondria, no energy, no vitality. So the good news, you can, and all your mitochondrial DNA comes from your mother. Did you know that? So all of these mitochondria contain DNA, but that's maternal DNA. So you, the, the, the mitochondrial DNA all comes from the maternal side. Um, it's crucial for vibrant aging, optimal energy production, and protection against oxidative stress. Now we're going to talk later down the line, and I really do hope you keep coming because these are for you, these talks. Um, the energy source you choose for your brain, the type of fuel you feed your brain, determines how your mitochondria respond and how, what sort of longevity you get out of them. Look after your mitochondria. We're going to talk about that. So how do you upgrade your mitochondria? These are some of the ways. Switch their fuel source. We're going to talk about fasting and metabolic flexibility. Um, mitochondria get destroyed during free radical stress. If we give a refined sugar source, if particularly refined carbohydrates, if, we use, if we're feeding our mitochondria these fast-acting fuels all the time, there's lots of reactive oxygen species that get generated, and they destroy the mitochondria. So particularly refined carbohydrates. Quality sleep uses mitochondria. There's a process called the glymphatic system in the brain, which cleans your brain out during the night. And this system is dependent on good mitochondrial function to work well. What's hit high-intensity interval training has been shown to increase the density and efficacy of mitochondria in your skeletal muscle. Proper ex exercise that's, that's deliberate and intentional can boost your mitochondrial function. Hormesis. What's hormesis? Anyone know? Anyone heard of hormesis? So the hormesis is simply the principle that a little bit of what might be harmful can be somewhat beneficial. So that's the principle of hormesis. Which, so like a plant produces various compounds to protect itself, and some of those compounds, though potentially poisonous, in small amounts confer protection. And we can get benefit from the plants for some of those hormetic compounds. But when it comes to your mitochondria, cold showers. Anybody like cold showers? <laughs> so cold showers are one of the things that regenerate mitochondria. So if you haven't got a major cardiovascular contraindication to it, try cold showers. It's a discipline you can develop. But once you finish your shower, do your whatever you want to do with it under warmth. That's fine. But at the end, try 30 seconds of cold and then try push it to a minute. Put your brain under the cold water. And they've shown that that kind of thermal stress helps to upregulate new mitochondrial function. So you can regenerate your mitochondria through cold showers. That's one of the ways. And then so there's a, we're going to talk a little bit about some nutrients and supplements that help the brain as we go along. One of them for that helps your mitochondria is a thing called PQQ, perloquinoline quinone. It's a supplement that, that helps to optimize mitochondrial function. If you want a healthy brain, I hope you've heard you need good mitochondria. Your brain is 73% water. It takes only 2% dehydration to affect your attention, memory, and other cognitive skills. 2% dehydration. I find on a Sabbath I'm often prone to dehydration, don't you? We don't often carry a water bottle. You often tend to get behind with, when it comes to hydration on Sabbath. A hydrated brain is a happy brain. If you're grumpy and tired, first try some water. 90 minutes of sweating can temporarily shrink the brain as much as one year of aging does. Isn't that profound? 90 minutes of heavy sweating. So your brain weighs, these are just some fun brain facts. So we're getting to know, this is a brain primer, getting to know our most important organ of influence. Your brain weighs about 1.3 kilograms. 60% of the dry weight is fat, making the brain the most fatty organ in the body. I like that picture, one brain calling someone, the other brain fatty. But you literally, we literally are fatheads. So if you don't, 60% of the dry weight of your brain is fat. If you, if you have the wrong fat, what is the wrong fat, folks? Margarine. Margarine is floor polish. Don't eat margarine. Seriously. Floor polish. Um, you want to think about the fat that I'm putting in is becoming part of my brain structure. My brain hardware is being affected by the fat I'm taking in. So here we're talking about polyunsaturated fatty acids, or omega-3s. Now, we can, we, when we get to nutrition in the brain, we'll talk about the sources of omega-3s. Obviously, there's fish oil sources, and there's seed oil sources. 
but your brain is made up of polyunsaturated fatty acids and phospholipids. Choose the best quality fat to get into your brain. It literally forms the structure of your brain. And remember when these neurons, so the fats that we take in, the fats that we take in become part of the membranes lining your neurons. And those neurons, those membranes have receptors in them. And if you want to have good neuron transmission, nerve transmission, you need those membranes to be flexible. If we eat the wrong fats, those membranes become rigid and they become sclerosed and aged. So your ability to hear at a neuronal level in terms of membrane flexibility is affected by the type of fats you're taking in. Polyunsaturated fatty acids. Throw out the margarine. Omega-3, omega-3, omega-3. 25, and most of us are eating too much omega-6. Sunflower oil is an omega-6 fat. And most of us, if you buy chips, they're saturated in um, oxidized sunflower oil. So you're not going to make a champion brain on fries. It's just not going to happen. So the brain needs cholesterol. Okay, we live in the era where and the, the science of cholesterol has gone through a number of shifts. Cholesterol wasn't spoken about, then it became the big baddie. And now we're realizing that cholesterol is important in many structures inside the brain and the body. So without enough cholesterol, your brain starts to die. It does need cholesterol. No one knows for sure, but the latest estimate is that our brains contain roughly 86 billion brain cells. 86 billion. I don't know who counted. I don't want to count. Isn't that a beautiful picture? That's the wiring diagram of the brain. So each neuron can transmit a thousand nerve impulses per second and make as many as tens of thousands of synaptic contacts with other neurons. The brain is an organ of connection. It wants to connect. And the great news is that the brain is, is plastic. Most of us, yeah, myself and Paul, when we did medicine, we were taught that the brain, once it dies, that's it. But the brain is plastic. It has plasticity. And there's a process called neurogenesis, which means new nerves can grow under the right environment. And we're going to look at some of those, those environmental influences. But you can stimulate your brain to sprout new neurons. Isn't that exciting? So think of a, so when a baby's born, they're born with this block of potential in their head with lots, lots of axons and stuff that need pruning. And they go through this major cutting away process of stuff they don't need. The brain is literally molded and shaped. Your brain remains a dynamic organ until you die. It becomes less so as you age, but it is a dynamic organ of connection. It can mold and change by what we're doing. Youngsters, you're reading this one. As any parent can attest, teenage brains are not fully formed. It isn't until about the age of 25 that human brains reach full maturity. And isn't it crazy that we have to make the most important decisions of our lives after 18? How do you think that's crazy? The frontal lobe is the last part of the brain that becomes fully mature. And that's the executive decision-making part of your brain. So now you must decide at 18 what work you want to do, perhaps who you want to marry, you know, uh, where you're going to live. Youngsters, you need guidance. And it's not a, this is a reality of neuroscience. We were made to live a lot longer than we are living. Our brains take a while to mature. I like this one. Man's brains are approximately 10% bigger than women's, even after taking into account larger body weight. However, the hippocampus, which is about memory, is larger in the ladies. Guys, that means she forgets nothing. <laughs> eh? So when you've forgotten it, she still remembers. Her hippocampus is bigger. And uh, Albert Einstein's brain weighed uh, 1.23 grams, so slightly lighter than most, but he had far more neuronal connections. So it's about the connections we make. And the brain is very much a use it or lose it organ. If you don't, so part, we're going to look at the things that damage the brain. We're going to look at the things that heal the brain. And part of what heals the brain is healthy stimulation. <laughs> Note the words, healthy stimulation. Burning the midnight oil, studying till 3 o'clock in the morning, not sleeping is not healthy stimulation. So early to bed, early to rise really does make a difference, but healthy stimulation. Sorry, that's a bit small. Chronic stress, so the effects of modern lifestyle on the brain. Chronic stress and depression can cause measurable brain shrinkage. The modern diet is low in the omega-3s, you've spoken about that. So since the Victorian era, average IQs have gone down 1.6 points. Attention spans are getting shorter. 
In 2000, the average attention span was 12 seconds. Now it's eight seconds. Isn't that scary? The sh that's shorter than the nine second attention span of the average goldfish. Do you want an attention span that's less than a goldfish? Not particularly. So something's happening in modern life that's affecting our concentration, our attention spans. Um, this is an interesting one, just a fun fact. Relying on GPS makes your brain lazy. Learn to entrench the pathways and to, to remember which way to go. You know, I use GPS mostly now for ways because it tells me the quickest route to get somewhere, even though I know the way, if there's, if there's a blockage. But don't use a map for a place you know where you're going to. It's uh, making your brain lazy. You get synaptic pruning. Your brain storage capacity is considered virtually unlimited. Isn't this amazing? It doesn't get used up like RAM in your computer. The latest research allows or shows that the brain's memory capacity is a quadrillion bytes. Quadrillion bytes. The same amount needed to store the entire internet. Wow. Listen to this one. This computer is one of the most powerful computers in the world. When programmed to simulate human brain activity, it took 40 minutes to crunch the data equivalent to just one second of brain activity. <laughs> so a fascination with your organ of influence is the intention. So here we have the brain software on the hardware. Ellen White said the following, nothing tends to promote health of body and soul than does a spirit of gratitude and praise. It is a positive duty to resist melancholic, discontented thoughts and feelings, as much a duty as it is to pray. If we are heaven-bound, how can we go as a band of mourners, groaning and complaining all the way along to our Father's house? Isn't that important? Let's face it. Let's be honest. Life in South Africa is challenging, is it not? And I'll be the first to admit, it's so easy to see the thorns. The problem is when we focus on the thorns. I'm not saying we must live as ostriches in denial. I'm saying when we focus on the thorns, it becomes part of our conversation. It affects you and the people around you. It's a positive duty to resist discontented melancholic thoughts, as much a duty as it is to pray. The relation that exists between the mind and the body is very intimate. When one is affected, the other sympathizes. The condition of the mind affects the health to a far greater degree than many realize. Many of the diseases from which men suffer are the result of mental depression. Grief, anxiety, discontent, remorse, guilt, distrust, all tend to break down the life forces and to invite decay and death. Courage, hope, faith, sympathy, these are the things we must talk, love, promote health and prolong life. A contented mind, a cheerful spirit is health to the body and strength to the soul. A merry, rejoicing heart doeth good like a medicine. Choose what you think about and think about what you think about. It's important. What your thoughts react on your physiology. My thoughts react on my physiology. I'm putting these, these quotes are a bit long, but they are so powerful. I need to share these with you. God desires to bring men into, this is from the chapter Mind Cure in Ministry of Healing. That's where it comes from. God desires to bring men into direct relation with himself. In all his dealings with human beings, he recognizes the principle of personal responsibility. He seeks to encourage a, pers a, a sense of personal dependence and to impress the need of personal guidance. He desires to bring the human being into association with the divine that men may be transformed into the divine image, the divine likeness. Satan works to thwart this purpose. He seeks to encourage dependence upon men. What do people tell you? Speak to that person, speak to that person. No, we need each other. What Ellen White is saying is our first dependence must be personal dependence on God ourselves. Um, so we've said the brain is an organ of connection. You want to keep it healthy, you have to acknowledge and treat it as an organ of connection. Um, I'm just going to show you a short clip. Let's do this quickly. We get sound. State of the art avionics. Command, stand by. But your map is from the 15th century. Command, please advise, please advise. 
Neuroscientists are stuck in this harrowing predicament as they try to make their way around the human brain. The first classical map made about a century ago that is still widely used today. Published in 1909, it defined regions on the pinkish-gray organ that control our actions and functions. The fundamental unit of brain organization for the cerebral cortex is what we call a cortical area. So on the map, you could say there's a country called speech, another called short-term memory, another hand movement. Identifying every one of these cortical areas became a major objective of the Human Connectome Project, the HCP, leading the effort a master mapmaker. I consider myself a cortical cartographer. By July of last year, the HCP completed its first phase, a 21st century world map of the brain. We reported the presence of 180 distinct cortical areas. 97 of them were new to brain science. The connectome gives us this opportunity, a really great tool to be able to navigate the human brain. Navigating the brain is more than just naming cities and states. You need to understand the connections between them. The word connectome implies that the fundamentally important thing about brains is connections. This evening, we'll be talking and learning about two different kinds of connections. Tom's sake, sorry. So many of us will have heard of the Human Genome Project, right? So now neuroscientists are at the point where they say they want to map the connections inside the brain. A little bit of a bigger task. So what's resulted is what we call these wiring diagrams. They want to see which parts of the brain are connected via cabling. So these are cabling or wiring diagrams of the brain. And there are, there are structural connections and there are functional connections. And this little clip, this last clip I want to show you is from one of the neuroscientists describing what they've done with a mouse brain. So just listen to this and then I'll comment. tell the colors apart because even at the finest level of resolution of the light microscope then there's a picture of those bigger blobs or nerve cells and all that stuff in between that felt work are the gazillion wires that attach them and and you can't resolve them as individuals so yeah we have to go to a different technique so that's plan a so now plan b uh, is what we're working on now which is to do this uh, not with light and color, but use electrons, uh, which have a much shorter wavelength and give us the ability to resolve every one of these wires. And the way we do this is we take a block of brain and we fill it with a metal called osmium, and we take that block of brain filled with osmium, that little black spot in there, and then we put it in a plastic, very hard plastic, and we put it on a chuck, and we move it up and down against a diamond knife, that's what's going on in that a second picture. And then from there, uh, out comes one section after another. They're about a thousandth as thick as a human hair. Uh, so we get a thousand per hair thickness. And then we pick them up on a tape, and then we take a picture of each and every one of them with a very high resolution microscope. And the pictures are 250,000 pixels by 250,000 pixels each image, and then we have to take 33,333 sections like that to do a cubic millimeter. Sorry. 2D and do 33,333 right. to make it 3D. Right, so it's basically a film strip, and you take those pictures and you stack them up, and you get a stack of images that are now a three-dimensional version of the brain, and then you color in the objects using deep convolutional neural nets uh, to generate uh, the structures in the brain. Here is a dendrite of a nerve cell and an axon uh, yeah, talking uh, to that cell uh, in green. And, that, and that's one little piece of an area that we did that is just so discouraging. It's so depressing. <laughs> There's just so much stuff <laughs> in these brains. There's 1,500 nerve cells. This is three billionths of a mouse brain. Three bill it took us five years to do three billionths of a mouse brain when we started. It's just extraordinary. And a synapse every cubic micron, so there are 1,500 synapses in there. Uh, yeah. 
I, I wanted to play that for you. Just his expression at the end is just so priceless because that's the kind of um, amazing structure we're dealing with. One cubic millimeter of a mouse brain took them five years to analyze in terms of the amount of connections. So this is the kind of complexity of the brain that you're sitting with that you need to look after. And that's a mouse brain. I think we're a little bit more sophisticated than mice, hopefully. So the human connectome is the next project, trying to do the wiring diagrams of the brain. See which wires go where. Isn't that beautiful? So they do special scans to see where the water is distributed along the, the cabling of the brain. These are wiring diagrams of the brain for the electricians amongst us. <laughs> to sort this wiring out. So some of the anatomy and the arrangement of the brain. Um, outside of the brain, we have the cerebral cortex. So the cerebral cortex is the outer rim of tissue, the gray cells. So the, tip, the gray cells that you've all heard about is the cerebral cortex. There are six layers of cells within the human cerebral cortex. The outermost layer, um, and then that section that you're seeing here is what we call a coronal section. So we've taken the brain and cut it that way from the front. And you'll see the cerebral cortex is folded. When anything's folded, the purpose is to increase the surface area. If you take a paper, and the same thing happens in the... We had this physiology lecture who always said, structure is related to function. Structure is related to function. The way something's designed tells you what its function is. And the folding in the, in the body is to increase surface area. You want this massive surface area to put all these cells on. Um, so you've got the, white, the, the gray cells on the outside, and that white stuff on the inside is the white matter, which is the cabling. And that cabling is running between different regions of the brain. So the cells with their cabling is running towards different areas. So we all know this, we've got the frontal lobe, the temporal lobe, the parietal lobe, and the occipital lobe. That frontal lobe is the gold. That's the part with which we worship God and appreciate, and which we make our best decisions or our worst decisions, depending on how the brain is functioning. The brain is a hierarchical arrangement, complex to less complex. The outer part of the brain, the cerebrum, with the cerebral cortex, is more complicated. It goes down to the limbic system or the emotional brain. So this rim of tissue is your, for want of a better term, the emo emotional brain. So that outer rim is designed to govern your emotional brain. We're not meant to just fly off the handle and do whatever we feel. The governor, the frontal cortex, is the one that's controlling what we're feeling and how we respond to it. What happens when people get drunk? They take their frontal lobe offline. So they, the, the alcohol is a frontal lobe suppressant. Many drugs are a frontal lobe suppressant. That's why you'll get people that will be totally lucid and can hold a conversation, hopefully like I'm holding, and put alcohol into them, and they'll run naked down the street. That's because the frontal lobe is not governing their choice. And I want to put to you today that our frontal lobes are under assault from many different sources. And though the original guy that on which this science was, came to an understanding about was Phineas Gage, the famous guy that blew off his frontal lobe on the railway track. You know, he was dampening the, making a hole in, uh, to build a railway. The dynamite exploded and the pole shot through his face and shot off his frontal lobe. So he was a fundamentally different person. And the understanding of the importance of frontal lobe function largely came from the experience of Phineas Gage. And many of us are experiencing a functional frontal lobotomy. Many of the, the lifestyle challenges that we're facing, the types of diets, the lack of sleep, the substances we use, are causing frontal lobe dysfunction, in a sense. And you can have a functional frontal lobotomy. So that's the cortex. That's its folded structure. That's the structure of a neuron. It's got a cell body, an axon, and a schwann, uh, uh, the, the dendrites, which then form the synapses. So in the brain, you've got cells that are converting electrical energy to chemical energy back to electrical energy. That's the, that's the transfer of information. Isn't it amazing that as I'm talking, electrical activity is governing my speech area, my memory, and yours when you do, and somehow making sense of that. Isn't that incredible? And this is, this is what's happening. It's transmission of electrical information via a synapse to another neuron. Um, that's just mind-blowing. That's the synapse. And when that electrical signal gets to the, the, the terminal of the axon, it causes calcium to come into 
the presynaptic terminal, this little button, and that calcium causes, fuses with the membrane and causes what we call exocytosis of these neurotransmitters. So you've all heard of serotonin, dopamine, noradrenaline. Um, these are some of the neurotransmitters of the brain. And this electrical activity is causing release of these neurotransmitters. So part of a healthy brain requirement is that you have an energy supply, you have intact membranes, you have a hydrated brain, you have amino acids that can form your neurotransmitters. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and I know this very well. Embryology, the brain forms from a tube. So literally, you get a ball of cells that, um, as a result of fertilization, and that ball of cells forms an invagination, or a fold along the back, and that becomes your brain and spinal cord. And it forms from a part of the tissue called ectodermal tissue. My brain is sensing what's happening in my environment. If I touch my skin, it's sensing something from the outside, which is why the brain's derived from tissue that was on the outer side of the embryo. And it's the same thing with your gut. Your gut is also derived from um, ectodermal tissue, uh, parts of it. So your brain literally forms from a tube, folds like that, forms into vesicles, and then you'll see these parts. I see Emmanuel's here. Emmanuel's an R man. So You'll see there's a part there called the diencephalon that forms the eyes. So your eyes are literally extensions of your brain. Um, that's the embryology of the brain. It ends up like that. So how's, how has psychiatry traditionally worked? So psychiatry traditionally works is you, if I'm your psychiatrist, you come to me and you say, Doc, I've been feeling this, 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 and this. And I think back to my psychiatry training, and I'm not knocking psychiatry at all, but I'm saying the traditional way is to say, listen, according to the DSM, which is a diagnostic and statistical manual, you have five out of these nine symptoms. You've had them for two weeks. Therefore, you're depressed. That's how traditional psychiatry has worked, on a constellation of symptoms. So if you meet a certain definable set of symptoms, you will receive a diagnostic label of psychosis, of depression, generalized anxiety disorder, et cetera, dementia, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Those, those codes of diagnosis are all found in this diagnostic and statistical manual. Excuse me, manual. That's this one here. This is the latest edition, DSM-5. So there's this guy I mentioned last week. He's also a psychiatrist, but what he's doing now, he says, how can we know if we never look? So he's starting to scan his patients and to look at brain scans of patients with mental health issues and brains that are not working well. He uses a technique called SPECT scanning. So SPECT scanning, um, basically there's, we've got a nuclear medicine lady here too. So you inject a new radionucleotide probe into the body and this probe goes to the brain through the circulation and it shows areas that are functioning in excess or functioning in insufficiency or functioning at a normal level. Areas of overfunction, underfunction, or normal function. How you feel, how you think, how you concentrate is determined by the balance of neural, neuronal activity happening at any given time. As based on your nutrition, your hormones, your stress level, your fatigue, that balance of factors is affecting, and whether or not there's some area of dysfunction in your brain is determining how you are functioning at any given moment. So these, these are the functional scans he's doing. He tells a story of how he became, he started to get into this kind of work. He had a nephew, who still has a nephew, called Andrew. And Andrew's mother phoned him the one day, and he said, my child is not the same. He attacked a girl on the playground, um, which is totally out of character. They went into his bedroom. They found pictures of him hanging himself from a tree. And the mom said, this is not who Andrew is. And Daniel Amen was just getting started in the scanning business, and he said, we'll have to scan his brain. And they found this. This is the scan, the spec scan of the undersurface of uh, Andrew's brain, which shows there on the left, you, if you look carefully on the temporal lobe, so you're looking at the brain from the undersurface, OK? On the left, your right, on the right side of the screen, which is the left side of the patient's brain. That's the temporal lobe. You see that little indentation there on the temporal lobe. There was a cyst the size of a golf ball putting pressure on Andrew's brain. And he had to convince, because this work was in its inception, he had to convince a surgeon 
to take the cyst out. Because the pediatrician at the time said the cyst probably is not having an effect. He eventually took it out, and Andrew was a change boy overnight. He woke up smiling. The point I want to make with this is behaviors come from something. Where people's behaviors are an expression of their neurophysiology. Yes, you get different personalities. Not everything is pathological, and I'm not trying to pathologize everything. But when people's behavior goes beyond a certain part of the spectrum, it's often, if you have excess anxiety, excess worry, if you can't concentrate, if you're not sleeping, these are symptoms often of a brain that's not working well. And it's not that there's something dramatic wrong with you, that you've got this mental health disorder. It's all right to need help. It's all right to need to optimize areas of your health. Your brain, like your heart, can have pathology. This is the concept we're trying to highlight. So listen to what Daniel Amen has to say. Sorry, let's go back. You just get some sound if possible. Thanks, guys. In, right? Everybody's talking about their mental illness, but it's the wrong discussion. The discussion is about brain health. We're the unhappiest we've been since the Great Depression. Suicide skyrocketed, depression, anxiety, drug abuse skyrocketed in children. Anti-anxiety medications like Xanax went up 20 percent in teenagers. That is a nightmare because it's the wrong solution. And I'm not opposed to medicine. It's just never the first thing I think about. It's like, let's get your brain and your habits right, and then we'll see what you need. And more than half the people taking medicine really don't need it. Last year, 337 million prescriptions for antidepressants in the United States. That's insane talking about that being insane, which is quite funny. But um, so that's the point. That's how we should be practicing medicine. You first got to say, what rules are you perhaps breaking? If you come with a symptom complex, my first, as a lifestyle type oriented doctor, surely I should say to you, where are you breaking the basic laws of your constitution? If I don't start there, I'm not opposed to medication. Let me tell you something now. There's a place for medication, even psychiatric medication. But it shouldn't be the first place. And that's what he's saying, is that we need to look, we need to consider what might be amenable to something that I can change. Um, this is the message. So this is the scans he's doing. He's doing these spec scans. You see that that brain is full of holes. Those are functional holes. That brain is not going to be working well. So I would love to do an experiment of all of our brains at Silverleaf. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? I'd love to start with my own. I'd love to know my own brain's activity and where, where I can improve. Um, because that's what it's about. It's about getting, being the best you can be. And if you have the most balanced brain function, you're the best version of yourself that you're ever going to be. And that's the message. Um, and the lifestyle interventions we're going to be sharing, the things that damage the brain, are all for that purpose, that we can best express our personality that God gave us um, in the healthiest possible way, with energy, enthusiasm, creativity, the things he made us for. That's the idea. So brain aging is optional. What a concept. We were talking about it earlier. We think it's inevitable that when I get to 60, 70, 80, I must, sorry for, to be graphic, but start drooling and forget my own name. We, this is not normal, friends. This is not how we were made. Now, it happens for various reasons. There are various causes of dementia. But a lot of the time, dementia precursors start 30 to 40 years before you get dementia. The things you're choosing today are affecting how you're going to age neurologically. Whether I'm eating a free radical-based diet, the wrong fats, lots of stress, artificial stuff, no sleep, toxins, how my gut's working, we're going to look at that, my digestion, all of these factors are affecting how my brain is aging and how your brain is aging. And that's what we're going to look at. So a key concept, people's behaviors are a reflection of what is happening in their brains. Now, don't pathologize everybody and say, ah, your brain's dysfunctioning. But the reality is this is what's happening. And we can help if we know a few of the tools. Now, the challenge, spec, scans, spec CTs are available in South Africa, I do believe. But the challenge is we need 
practice at interpreting them in this light. Because what Daniel Amen does, he, and he's not the only guy doing it, but he started it. He looks at the scans and then he will say, you will target areas of functional, over-functional, under-functional, and give you a therapy based on what your scan is looking like, um, which is really interesting. So when our brains are broken, our capacity to be effective for God and his work in and through us is crippled. When we fix and optimize brains, you fix relationships and families. This is why the fuss. This is why I'm giving the talk I'm giving, because a lot of what we, how we are towards our, the people closest to us is affected by how we're feeling and how our health is going. And the people closest to us take the brunt of where we're at a lot of the time. When our brains are broken, our close relationships suffer. We hurt ourselves and others. So what are expressions of brains under strain? Depression, anxiety, insomnia, emotional reactivity, rage, obsession, fixation. It's not okay to say, oh, I just fly off the handle. <laughs> you know, that's my personality. Um, a lot of the time it's because we're having some challenges that we need to work on. Um, and if, you're, if your brain is not working well, if your frontal lobe is somewhat offline, you can often operate from your emotional brain. And you can be what's called emotionally labile. Excessive worry, neurosis, poor concentration, poor memory. So they found with dementia that one of the earliest antecedents, an antecedent is something that goes before, one of the earliest antecedents of dementia is poor brain circulation. So you really want to keep your circulation to your brain as good as possible for as long as possible. That's why we hear of vascular dementia. Vascular dementia is because the blood vessels of the brain are diseased. And because the brain has such a high metabolic rate, it needs a constant healthy blood supply. So um, cardiovascular disease is not just affecting your heart and your coronary arteries. It's affecting the arteries in your brain. It's affecting the arteries in your kidneys. It's affecting your arteries all over your body. Who's been to London and seen that Body Works thing? It was also here in South Africa. Uh, fascinating. If you ever get a chance to see Body Works, they basically plasticize a human cadaver, and they dissect everything. And there's one that shows you the vasculature of the body, the number of blood vessels and where they're going. There's something like 400 miles of blood vessels in your brain. Um, but the point is, look after your circulation. High blood pressure, high cholesterol, free radical stress, um, these are the things that damage the endothelium, the lining of the blood vessel. We can talk a bit about cardiovascular health down the line. Um, but the, the arteries in your brain, some of the smallest arteries are there, and they're going to be affected. The smallest arteries are affected first by pathology. That's why elderly people can get these, what, these small vessel strokes. They get in this, what's called the lenticular striate branches of one of the arteries. Um, and small vessels, small vessels in your eye, small vessels in your kidneys. Um, cardiovascular health. So a healthy brain, on the contrary, hang in with me, we're coming to the end. <laughs> healthy brain sleeps well, thinks clearly, concentrates well, is emotionally stable, has a desire for good food. Do you know when your brain's in balance, you don't feel like eating McDonald's? Do you know that? Often because your brain is out of balance, you feel like eating McDonald's. Because your brain is, your body's getting you to choose that to give you a quick fix lift. It's getting you to choose things to try and give you a quick serotonin and dopamine lift. A healthy brain actually wants to exercise. Did you know that? <laughs> a healthy brain desires to do good things. So, yeah. And makes good decisions. Okay, so to head towards the end, what makes a brain unhealthy? Excess and chronic stress. Ellen White says that many are cripples from a disease of which the cause is wholly imaginary. Sometimes stress is real, sometimes it's perceived. Um, we face stress, stress is real in modern life. A little bit of stress is good, a little bit of stress keeps you going, it makes you study for your final exam. Too much stress and you become dysfunctional. So the benefits of stress is a, is a curve, isn't it? It's not linear. It reaches a point where it becomes destructive and stress destroys the brain. They've shown that stress shrinks your hippocampus. So if you're studying for an exam and you want to remember, you're shrinking the structure that you're trying to remember with, if you're stressed, if you're excessively stressed. Just can damage your frontal lobe, your hippocampus, your amygdala, um, the gut. 
the gut and the brain are inseparable. If your gut is diseased, your brain is diseased. If your digestion is not healthy, your brain won't be healthy because there are barriers. You can, as you can appreciate, the neurons of the brain require such a tightly regulated environment to function well. They've got barriers called the blood-brain barrier. And that blood-brain barrier allows the right things across and keeps the bad things out. When your gut is inflamed, and we're gonna talk about that in our next seminar in six weeks time, not now, um, we're gonna talk about the gut, Inflamed gut means an inflamed brain. When, you're, when your brain's inflamed, you're not going to think clearly, you're going to have a foggy brain, you're going to get tired, you're not going to make the best decisions. Um, a brain that's inflamed does not operate well. So we want a, brain, a gut that's not inflamed, like that one, because the gut is talking to the brain, the brain is talking to the gut. What you had for lunch now is affecting how you're thinking. Okay, there is this circulation happening, which is draining it away from your brain as well, but there's substances that are going across. So that's an inflamed brain. So inflammation is very destructive to your brain. If you constantly taking into your body things that you're allergic to or sensitive to, you say, I'm going to eat gluten no matter what, because <laughs> I like gluten, I love gluten. But I know I'm a bit sensitive to gluten. And if I eat too much of it, then my IQ drops about 50 points. <laughs> I can feel it. And it's the reality. It's not a nice reality, but it's my reality. And I can tell you I'm not alone. Many people are responding to things like gluten and dairy. We shouldn't be eating dairy. Um, and various other substances in their diet that are inflaming their guts and inflaming their brains. Daniel Amen has a question he always asks before he takes something into his body. Will this love me back? Will this love me back? Simple question to ask. My grandmother always used to say that, I love it, but it doesn't love me. <laughs> and I thought, oh, yeah, yeah, whatever. But she's right. You've got to say, um, is this thing that's, is, this, is it really going to be to my, in my best interest to take this in? Hormone balance. A healthy brain needs healthy levels of hormones. There's a saying in functional medicine that says, um, our hormones don't decline because we age. We age because our hormones decline. Think about that. Our hormones don't decline because we age. We age because our hormones decline. A healthy brain needs healthy cortisol levels. It needs healthy testosterone levels. It needs healthy progesterone and estrogen levels. One of the reasons brains misfunction is because of hormonal disruption, and we're going to talk about that. So insulin is... F so just a little summary of hormones. This is not the talk on hormones. Hormones work in an in a ascending hierarchy in the body. You've got basal hormones affecting the function of the apex hormones. So at the bottom, the very bottom, most important hormone first to get under control is, drum roll, brrr, insulin. If your insulin's out of whack, much of your hormonal hierarchy might be out of whack, including your thyroid gland, your adrenals. Um, so it's essential that we understand healthy insulin function, what causes poor insulin function, and how to get it back in control. And we're going to be talking about that in a separate lecture. But a high insulin level is pro-inflammatory. It destroys your brain. It inflames your tissue. Adrenal glands. If you don't have enough cortisol in the morning, you don't, your brain doesn't wake up. Cortisol from the adrenal glands is one of the reasons we wake up in the morning. The adrenal glands go through a circadian rhythm. They, highest, they secrete their highest levels of hormones at 8 o'clock in the morning and lowest at 11 o'clock at night. And so... If your adrenals are tired or behind, you can find that your brain only switches on at about 11 o'clock in the morning. Anybody, you find that? Don't have to put up your hand. Um, you start you're tired, and then eventually your brain comes online at about 11 o'clock in the morning. And that can often indicate problems with your adrenal glands and circadian dyssynchrony. Hormones. Being overweight. This is the spec CT of an obese person. You can see some of the holes when you get more and more weight, because inflammation increases with body weight. The, the higher your body mass index, the more fat you carry, the more inflamed you are. The more inflamed you are, the smaller your brain. The volume of your brain shrinks. I'm not trying to scare you, I'm giving you the facts and incentive. This is why we're doing this, so we can get healthy together. Nutrient deficiencies. The brain has certain key nutrients, we can look at that in a separate talk. Things it must have to be healthy. Poor quality sleep and sleep disordered breathing. Uh, we're going to talk about that. 
lack of exercise, being sedentary, is putting you in the grave sooner. Head trauma. It's not cool to hit a soccer ball with your head. You know that. It might look cool, <laughs> but it's not the best idea. The brain is the, is the consistency of soft butter, a little bit harder than soft butter. And inside the brain, if you look at that, that's the base of the skull. Um, you've got the frontal lobe sitting on that anterior cranial fossa. That, so this is anterior cranial fossa, middle cranial fossa, and posterior cranial fossa. And the brain sits on top of that. And there's, you'll see there there's bony ridges. There's sharp ridges and protuberances inside the brain. If you're going to shake your brain around, <laughs> and let me tell you, if you hit a ball, someone kicks a ball from one side of the soccer field, I'm just giving soccer as the example, um, and you header it from the other side of the field, there's a lot of momentum on that ball. That hits your brain, hits your head, and yes, you've got a skull, but it cre creates an energy transfer to the brain, which makes the brain bounce back a bit in its cerebrospinal fluid. It can hit the bottom backside. It's not, I'm not saying that's going to cause irreparable damage at that time. What he's saying, which I agree with, is don't hit things with your head. <laughs> we have a skull to protect this delicate brain for a reason. Um, and don't believe me, this is a scan of an NFL player. So he scanned NFL players. This guy had been doing NFL for 12 years. Look at that brain on the undersurface. Now, there might have been other factors. You can say maybe there were confounding variables. But these kind of things get repeatedly shown. Discourage your children from partaking in contact sports, which put them at risk of significant head injury. When you go mountain biking like us, wear a helmet. <laughs> Simple. It's, it's not, don't, I'm not saying don't go mountain biking. Wear a helmet. Protect the frontal lobe. You know, when I fell last week, I fell on my arm, not my head. <laughs> I'm thinking I've got to protect the brain. You know, so um, important. Addictive behaviours. So that's a marijuana user on the right. Doesn't look very appealing, does it? <laughs> Youngsters, I, I want to urge you. Smoking, vaping, alcohol, marijuana, well, no matter what they tell you, it's going to damage your brain. And if you want to be a person of influence for God, you don't want a brain that looks like that. Uh, please, please, please don't engage in this behavior. Um, so requirements for a powerful brain. Toxin-free, we're going to talk, this is the introductory talk. We're going to unpack these nine subsequent talks as part of the health lecture series. So toxin-free with, with intact blood-brain barrier, no chronic infections or inflammation, stable fuel supply. This is an interesting one. If you don't have a stable fuel supply, your brain is going to be unhappy. The brain is, because it, there's so much activity going on, it needs a stable ATP supply. You can get that from glucose or from fat. And we're going to talk about that and how to switch between the two and some of the indicators. Powerful, not powerful, it's powerful mitochondria. <laughs> healthy fats for structure, healthy stimulation, balanced healthy levels of hormones, deep sleep with no sleep disordered breathing, and nutrient dense diet with fiber. We need community, connection, and purpose. We need each other. We're doing this together and an antioxidant protection. So the way forward, we're going to look at, to finish, the sieve through which you live is our next talk. The sieve through which you live. Uh, food on your mind. Your barriers, inflammation in your brain. Sick, fat, and tired. Why? Mastering your hormones and your metabolism, nutrition in your brain, uh, what your brain is hungry for, sleep the brain, and brain and sleep. And that's our introductory talk for today. Thank you for coming. So once every four to six weeks, we're going to have these talks. So if you can make yourself available, come along. The point is that we learn together, apply together, get healthy together, get in shape together. That's the plan. So blessings to you all. Thank you.